Hello. Uh, my name is Christoph Jorg, and this is um, this is Nino. Uh, Hello. Nino is in the jury, so if you have a filming competition, be nice <laughs> to her. Um, we know each other for a long time. Um, we have worked together before. Um, Nino is um, a filmmaker from, from Georgia. She lives in Paris. And she, oh, I forgot completely to say that this is um, a, a, a production. Um, it's uh, from the Doc Campus. The Doc Campus has kind of produced this and has kind of sponsored this. And, uh, and yeah, I'm part of you, you. I mean, no? And then, so thanks to the Doc Campus, we are here. So now, finish, we finished the, <laughs> the advertising. Um, well, yeah, Nino has made many powerful feature-length documentaries and always dealing with controversial subjects, always placing the human drama in the middle of her stories, always mixing the personal and, uh, and the universal. The film's always shot and edited with a very personal, sensitive, and very passionate approach. And um, what we do today here is we, we, we will show a couple of clips from about four of her films. And um, we try to comment them with you and give you an impression what, what, she, what she's doing. And, um, and we... Um, we probably should start with um, with clip number one, which is from a film that you did in in two thousand and three. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, tell me, right. tell my friends that I'm dead. Um, you have to know that all the films are basically um, shot in Georgia or in Russia or are in relationship with these two countries. And it's very rare for someone who works in France to always go back to the roots, but that's what she's doing. And, and then not many um, exceptions from that, from that rule in your, in your filmmaking so far. Yeah. Um, even if all the subjects um, are extremely diverse. And um, yeah, so we, we start with, with that little clip and uh, it gives you right away uh, an impression of, of what kind of films um, uh, uh, Nino is doing. Um, the, the, the session is called The Fine Line Between, between Fiction and Documentary. Um, I hope you will find out at the end of the session why we called it like that. So, here we go. First clip. These are probably the five first minutes of that film. What's the film talking about? Or, and, and why did you choose that scene in the beginning? Well, it was my third film that I was doing in France, and actually, it was it was dealing with uh, with one of the human mysteries, which is about death. And I shot it in um, the, the western side of Georgia, where it's very, very exuberant. And I remember when I went to Arte with the project, they said, "Did you smoke something?" Or are you sure that what you're telling is real? Because mainly, it's it's uh, the talk topic is death, but what I wanted to do is to show that in some cultures and in some uh, some um, regions, I mean, it's like um, that love sometimes can bring back something that is taken by death. And I remember when I went to Reiki, there was a big cemetery, like a, like a exhibition in Louvre, with a huge portraits, like bigger than human size. And they would stare at you, and it was painted and very colorful, and there were epitaphs from the first person saying, I am uh, whatever who lies here and who is looking now to you. You remember how nice it was when we went out drinking and having fun. And you know, you think that 
this is the case what Borges would probably call a magical reality, that this is the fictional side of our life, which is absolutely unbelievable. And I think no one in fiction would dare somehow to write a script like that, because these people and the reality somehow surpasses or bypasses the, the fictional level of, of, of um, of the, the fiction, I mean. And the, the, the aim was, uh, it was really tough because I was still considered as a beginner. I, it was my third film, Conforma, uh, what they call it, 90 minutes, you know, uh, about some crazy topic. And the thing was that I needed a dead man. I needed a, my, my, my main character should be somebody who died. So the, the preparation for the film, I spent like a month there. And this woman that you see at the opening shot, uh, and we open and close with her, even though the main story follows the main character, which I finally found. Um, um, I, I, uh, I spent a month living in this region because it's kind of taboo and they don't want to speak about it. And my assistant, who was a professional photographer, said to me, you are going to, beaten up, to be beaten up severely. And you know, you have, they will never allow you to be there with your camera, with your crew, because it's, it's just impossible. So what I did, I went to, to live there for a month, and I met everybody. I knew all the directors of the cemetery, all priests, all possible you know places where they would learn how how if anybody would die. And uh, I was asking these stupid questions, and I felt extremely stupid when I was saying, you know, I'm making a film. It's about love. It's about the relationship with which are lasting even after death, and how people can connect to their dear ones who are not here anymore but are somewhere. And they were looking at me saying, where are you coming from? I said, well, I'm from the capital, but I now live in France. So in France, you mean there are no deads in France or why you come to us? Anyway, and um, this woman, uh, she was celebrating ninth years of since the death of her son, which was the only son that she had. And we shot this sequence by chance, actually, because I knew that there was some preparation for this nine years anniversary. We finished with our main character, and we went there to see whether there were some interesting preparation or something. And there were piles of this wooden sort of stuff. And I just asked, what is this for? We were about to leave. Nothing very interesting was happening. And she said, well, we're going to bring his car inside. I said, OK, and, and can we film that? And she said, yes, but I don't know whether it's interesting or not interesting. And we, we shot it, and everybody, I mean, this is something that I couldn't plan, I couldn't imagine. And the, my main problem while editing and doing this film was how I possibly bring Western audience, because it was commissioned by France, uh, to this kind of setting. And I didn't want it to do something ethnographical or, you know, when you look to the people from Far Bay, like if there was a, some sort of a human zoo, oh, how strange they are. So, you know, the instructions that were given to my cameraman were that we don't know where we are. And it's probably some kind of a garage that they're repairing the car. And slowly we unveil uh, what it is all about. Um, and I decided to start with that to create this kind of, you know, almost a shock, like I experienced during the preparation when I was looking to the places. And you're just thrown into this super reality without having you know, any kind of preparation of your mind. OK, this is set there, and geographically it's there. No. I decided just to start mm. and see whether it works. And it's true that there are some sequences that are really you know, not easy to watch. But at the same time, the main thing was how to mix the life and death, how to put it in, in, in one sort of a, uh, it's all in one go. I mean, the sadness, the tears, the laughter, the, 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 the tragedy, and the comedy. And uh, I mean, editing was tough, because we were like 
you know, trying to play with many, many things at the same. It's, it was like pretty much like a cooking. You know, you mix sugar and salt and f something else, and then some strange taste comes out of it. And it was a weird film. That so you open your films very often with, with very symbolic scenes for the film. And yeah. um, uh, I, I, I would like to, to show uh, another clip from, it's not exactly the opening, I think, but um, it's, it's a film that you, that you did in Russia. It's called Durakovo, and you won some prize in Sundance for that film. That was, the film is from 2008. And... Um, after we show the clip, we, 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 we can talk about it. It's like, um, I feel there is always, um, there's always one scene in the film that, that resumes the whole, the whole um, idea, the yeah. whole idea of the film. Yeah. And, and um, let's show the clip and then we talk about it. Well, what this scene is doing for me is like you, 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 you strip down the main character of your film mm -hmm. um, to down to the essence by showing him naked, you know, in a swim, half naked in a swimming pool doing whatever, and then, and then you start the film. So, what is this film about, and who is this Michael Morozov? <laughs> uh, that that would just can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, the story of this film was, you were, I mean, you were involved in this right from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, it was part of Why Democracy Project. And uh, I was asked by Christophe and by, I mean, all channels were involved in it, BBC and uh, PBS and ITVS and everybody. And they wanted to get 10 filmmakers to make 10 films about the state of democracy and what does it mean for or against all around the world. And I heard about this guy, which is a millionaire. He lives very close to Moscow, like 150 kilometers. He has this castle in the middle of nowhere. You can't get in there uh, because he has all this protection system and strange, very strange system of telephones that uh, when first I saw it, I knew that I would play with that in, in a film. You don't know who is listening to whom, how it's connected, how can you listen to some conversations while he's talking talking to people and why he's making you to listen to that as well. And um, I had to, uh, so uh, in order to get there, I had a Russian assistant. It was all planned. Her father is very close to Putin, and he is very close to Putin's administration, to Russian Orthodox top, to, uh, Church top people, uh, to uh, to the Russian Parliament. Uh, he has a friend who was at the time a vice speaker of Russian Parliament, who also comes here, and we shot some stuff with him. And it was a mystery for me whether there is a film or whether there is a no film, so I went there for by myself, getting this Russian assistant, so he would, she would make a phone call, he would find out who the hell she was, and he would be very reassured, and uh, we went there, and to be very honest, on the first stage, after passing two weeks there, I thought, well, it's very exotic, it's very interesting, but there is no film where it's going. So I was really, you know, um, I was questioning myself whether I could make out of this um, uh, something that would fit in this, you know, why democracy project. But um, one day, it was his birthday, it was in February, I kept coming back, we were discussing, I was trying, basically, you have this castle, and there are people who would come by their own will in order to become a true Russian citizens of modern Russia. And in a way, this guy molds him, them, into this true Russian citizens. But the condition is you give away all your rights. You don't have any right at all, but you are doing it by your own will. There is no offense, there is nothing. You give him his passport, your passport, your money, your everything, and you stay there for, I don't know, unforeseen time because he decides when you're ready to go back to life. And, um, and you do whatever you're told to do. 
and there are sessions with all inhabitants. Some that are good are living in castle, others are living in village and cleaning some stuff or you know working for him for no money at all. And you can find amongst the inhabitants of this place uh, very young people like mm, I saw mm, 10 years old, 15 years old, whose fathers were involved in secret service or spying or something, and they decided that it was a good place for the children to come. Others are older. Some worked for Russian secret services like GRU and uh, uh, um, FSB. And uh, I wasn't allowed to talk to them at all to start with. And he set uh, very clear rules for me when I was walking around. But by coming back, I understood that there are some sessions in the monastery in Moscow between, the, the, between this guy, um, Russian parliament officials, uh, presidential administration, and Orthodox Church. I was allowed to see it from far away, but not to film it. Uh, and they are discussing the future of Russia. But this birthday where I was invited was the most revealing thing because uh, at some stage, you know, there were Russian generals in uniform. There were some people who were not wearing the uniform, and that was the own foreign body in there. And at some point, somebody stood up. He had, uh, like, you know, some dollars or something saying, oh, thank you very much from our department. We will never forget this. Uh, you know, nobody understood what it was. And I remember, you know, all was happening here. I turned my back pretending to laugh with somebody who was sitting next to me because I really got scared that somebody will walk me out. And uh, I don't know, I would disappear. And by the way, he was telling me often, in front of the crew as well, and uh, to me, to intimidate me, to saying, you know, you know, I can break your leg anytime I want. And he was great for the camera. I mean, it's one of the characters you think, it's like a fictional character with all the body language, his behavior, the way he was, how he could look at you, laugh, offer a, a chocolate and say, you remember how Trotsky died? Yeah, that was the first day of shooting, and my cameraman, who is a dear friend of me, he's Polish, and he was saying, you know, I filmed Karacic, he was filming Karacic with uh, Paul um, Pavlikovsky, and said, no problem, you know, I can take it and stuff. And um, thanks God, he was the only one Russian speaking, and another one was the girl who was 20 years old, uh, like my daughter's age at the time, and she was from Moscow. So he was, you know, this he did with me, Trotsky stuff, and he started, you know, you remember how Trotsky, it took 20 years, and he looked at the girl, and these very right poses time-wise. You live in Moscow, it's even easier for me and my friends. And you think you feel physically that you know your 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 blood just turning cold and you just cannot move. And because of the poses, and he was very gifted in this, and that's why it's it's clear that he worked for for KGB and all that. This is the technique of uh, intimidation. He would make you wait and he would say something and look at you like a, like a lion that thinks whether I should eat her now or whether I can give her some time. And you cannot help by, by reacting to that. You never know what he's capable of doing. So, you know, so you took, you took revenge by doing this film? Of course I did. <laughs> so oh, I, tell I, us I, about I, this scene then. Hundred <laughs> percent true. And that was the most unhappy shooting with my crew, which with whom I worked, you know, uh, for, for years. We did everything together. And I had only men except this very young girl who was incredibly brave and who would search and go everywhere and I was afraid that he could set dogs on her if he was angry because I was told you know I might not hold that the guy might not hold these dogs so be careful when you're doing things you know all shoot was like that in the instruction to the crew imagine you know like two meters tall guys you know brave filming Karacic and being told by somebody like me who looks like a clown you never intervene if he insults me me, if he throws things on me, if he tears my hair or something, 
you just walk out of the gate with your camera and you just shut up. And of course it created scandals in the crew and uh, things like that, but why we should go through this and I never saw my director being humiliated. But at the end, it's true what you said, I was so angry at him. And it was, the, yeah, and the condition of shooting was, I can stop shooting whenever I want. And because this birthday happened, and then I walked out to smoke, and then somebody followed me, and with brilliant French, he told me, oh, we know you're doing this film, and Mikhail Fyodorovich told me. And I said, how come you're speaking such a brilliant French? Oh, I was living in Belgium and then in Paris. And later, the main character told me, you know who's that? He was a resident spying after all French and uh, Belgium during the Cold War. And now the guy is the head of some bank. So you, you can imagine how these connections work from old times until today. And I, I realized, because you know, before saying yes to the shoot, he, he said, I'm not number one in this pyramid. So now you have to go to the church, meet my holy father, who was one of those who could eventually become the patriarch of Russia at the time, because he was very ill, the patriarch. And I remember this interview, which I, I will never forget it. He was wearing this private residence, wearing these big glasses that would make his eye look like that. And I, by that time, I knew what I should say and what I shouldn't say. So I played it open. I said, well, uh, nobody understands what Russia wants nowadays. Uh, everybody thinks that you are just gone completely insane. It's true that my grandfather was Russian. You saw my films. I never used the voiceover. So, you know, I, am, I, I want to understand by filming this place and by getting to Russian parliament, to the church, what the hell Russia wants and what, why Russia is so angry about anything that's happening in the West. And he said, suddenly he stood up when I said that, but I thought about how I should behave. And his glasses were just like this over my head. And I was looking at him, mesmerized, and asking whether I can take a photo. He said no. And he said to me, like a very good Christian and very good Russian citizen, colonel, general, whatever the name was, said the only thing that the West was, and he was coming closer and closer and closer to me, the only thing that the West wants is to put Russia on its knees. And I said, OK. <laughs> and I left. So I understood that actually, for me, this place was, there was some hidden stuff about these dollars that I never opened my mouth even to ask what the hell it was and what to make him understand that I understood what I understood at that moment. But it was kind of manufacturing the new human being that fits new Russia's interest. It's like at the time uh, during Soviet Union, they made this incredible experiment by you know uh, taking kids, uh, the pioneers or whatever, who would spy after their parents, denouncing their parents, their relatives, everybody basically, and uh, uh, letting the state know uh, who does what and who thinks what, and it was like rewarded by the state at the time. Something of the sort was happening at this, in this place as well. So um, I lost the line, though, what, why I was telling all that, no. that, that story of the filmmaking. Yeah. And I remember one I know you can talk forever, but we have, um, we have a little time problem, because we, have a, we, we, we prepared for like a two-hour session, and, <laughs> and we yeah. only have 60 minutes. So um, how are we going to do that? I don't know. I mean, well, we, we continue. 30 minutes. Yeah. Let's. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's... That's not good. Um, look, let's let's move to let's to let's move to another film that you did recently. Um, uh, was actually here last year in in, in competitions called Don't Don't Breeze. Um, and well, as you could see, what what she did with this film is like in a in a very intimate way. She she gets closer and closer to. To, to this to this guy Morozov, and in 2008, um, this film 
well, was for me like a kind of a, of, of a metaphor to where Russian leadership is, is, is heading to today. And this film was made in 2008, and what we see today with Putin in all of this is kind of, well, the proof that this film was uh, ahead of its time. And um, so with your last film, the last feature-length film you did, you, you moved deep into another subject, uh, one of your favorite subjects, which is the family, um, and family ties, and how family works, etc., etc. And again, it's, a, it's also a, a portrait of a man. Uh, what I feel in your films is that they're always, you, you, have a very, you have a very strong gift to, to, to get close to men and figure out um, who they are and what, what, what their hidden feelings are and I don't know how you do it but it's 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 actually fascinating to to observe that um, so we can we can see in this film how how a personal medical problem of some guy in Georgia becomes like a huge family crisis is that the right um, yeah. okay <laughs> so let's see the beginning of that film because we wanted to talk about yeah, this is really a About fine fiction, line. Yeah. A fiction and documentary, and this is um, you 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 reached at the top of this um, in here discussion yeah. with that with that film. Yeah. And, um, uh, can you can you tell us a little bit how did you? I mean, what's the film about? Then we give him time to to, and then we yeah yeah yeah. Actually, I want at this time I left all the big topics aside, because as a director I needed, I think, a new challenge. And I wanted to take as a main character an ordinary man with, uh, with uh, nothing, there is no music in this film, it's one, one hour and a half. There is no you know, political or any kind of these important issues involved. And it's like a little bit like Verdi, you know, like Traviata, somebody falls in love with somebody and suddenly it becomes, you know, something. And here, from starting from very simple problem, having a doubt about future, by having some sort of a arm, I don't know, pain in the arm, how it grows bigger, 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 appealing to all kind of human fragilities that we all have and we all hide. And the starting point was something of the sort happened to me. I couldn't move and couldn't write, and suddenly I start to see how my imagination and projection to future uh, was playing tricks with me. And I thought, well, okay, my life is finished, and then I looked for uh, to, to, to my family members, thinking they're not nice to me, and what was true and what was invented, nobody could make up any sense of it. So I knew that I could shoot without any problem in Georgia, and I was sitting there waiting for a middle-aged man to come, because it's also connected to middle-aged crisis and stuff like that. And somebody called me asking, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm waiting for my prince to come. And uh, she said, I, my friend wants, has some pain, and he wants to do a, a, a IRM, a, a, a MRI, or some, yeah. And I said, I'll pay for this. So I filmed. The, 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 as a test uh, with two guys who never filmed anything before because we had a very cheap camera but good quality image and he was amazing and then you know the, if you see the film except this scene of uh, shaving uh, the first four sequences is what we shot the first day because I realized that with this kind of character, this kind of wife that he had, this kind of friends who would take him to the different directions, that would be a real you know, promise of human drama. But then I, I was really lucky that something very unexpected came into during while we were shooting. So basically, if somebody asks me what the film is all about, I am saying it's about human fragilities and where it can take you and how you can somehow find yourself by losing everything. So you know that was the main point uh, in this film. But uh, and and if you see it, some. 
you know, I because I had no money at the beginning, and I think it was a very good film. There was no commission, there was no promise. Suddenly, I felt myself like a kid in I don't know the cabinet of chemical elements, playing with the characters and trying to set them up in some sort of a sequence to see whether it whether it would do a boom or whether it would do nothing. You know, like taking one character and thinking how possibly I can get them together without them knowing why I'm doing this. And uh, there were some extraordinary scenes that came out of, of of that game. And of course, in terms of a fine line, there was much more, how to say, you know, set up or manipulation with the characters because none of them knew where why I was, you know, trying to say, you know, we're shooting in this cafe and can you please come and can you please be there or something like that. And even I don't know because I don't know who was, you know, in charge of this whole thing. I never knew what was going to be the end of the film. And we had the same diagnosis. We saw three doctors. The three of them, they said totally different things. Uh, and, you know, the film grew from one sequence to another into something that, you know, now it's, yeah. And in terms of directing, of course, I remember I wanted to shoot a row inside the family because I felt that it was going to end up like that. So how you get there, you know, how I started to talk with them whether there will be a problem if one day it happens and we are there and, uh, you know, how they would, and I always thought that it was going to go to the bin straight away because you cannot possibly be there when husband and wife are arguing seriously. And, and, uh, and, it, it worked. I don't know how and I don't know why. Somehow, of course, I was living where they were living. I was almost a family member. I was also going to the same doctors because in Georgia you have like five great specialists and one has to see them. And I knew that psychologically speaking, this is what was going to happen. And because they don't have very much money, it costs money, and somehow it will bring in the conflict. But um, even being, even for me, that was very interesting how you can somehow push the boundaries and go somewhere else while shooting somebody, because otherwise I had to spend probably five years with them and, you know, not knowing where and how the films, the the the, the conflict would be brought in. Well, it's a bit of a difficult exercise we do now because we have you haven't seen the beginning, um, you haven't okay. seen a main character, but um, to maybe you you can you can yeah I, we, I think we, I we should have tell. A, you have the possibility you can probably comment at the same time that we that, that we watch what okay. we so we we show the scene where. Um, where this man is trying to see a doctor, but he doesn't really, or he only knows what, you do tell the audience what, what he knows, okay. what the person knows he meets, and what you know yeah. as a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then we, we can see a little bit how Nino works. Uh, yeah, this, this is one of the examples of what I was just saying, you know. It, so let's, let's, let's see the scene and First then you, scene? And, okay. yeah, and then you, you can, you can talk over it, I guess, I guess. That's... I don't think so. I, I, I will t give you some lines. Okay. You know, I met a painter who expo who works in New York, who is Georgian, and, uh, and uh, in, in the part, during the party. And the magical word at the time for me was bursitis. That was the diagnosis of my main character. And suddenly she comes to me and she says, you know, oh, I can't even paint, and now I'm stuck in Georgia because I have to be here, like, for a month, and I have this bursitis, and I can't, can't leave the hand and I'm expecting from New York my IRM to arrive and I said well can we film it when it arrives because I'm interested in bursitis and all this stuff and how medical situation works and she said yes of course I went to check where she lives and it's kind of Soviet big building with the you know you know don't have numbers and stuff and she it was okay for her that you know the day when she's expecting the postman to bring her this wonderful MRI that will tell her everything what's wrong with her we will be filming 
I checked the, the, the place when she lived and everything. And at the same time, my main character is told that at the same building, there is a doctor by his friend who is great, or her name was Lamara or something like that, and he should absolutely go there. So it was okay that we can accompany him filming. And when we arrived to that place, because there are no numbers, I said it must be this, for sure, this uh, entry where my painter lived with her, with her po postman uh, who was supposed to come that very day. And this is the sequence. You know, she is expecting the postman and he is expecting to see the doctor. Yeah, because this is the one of the, if we are talking about a thin line, yeah. this is a very thin line, actually. <laughs> Okay, but I don't really know what I mean. What the problem is, so. But probably DVD is better, no? Uh, it, that, that's the DVD yeah, that's the DVD. Right. Well, it all worked for us, so. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, of, of course. course. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Sorry, the guy with the swimming pool. Yeah. Guy, um, he was like very difficult, and quite really on set. Um, did Did you get angry when he saw himself depicted in the film? Because it, you know, forced to actually look at what his behaviour. He was forced to look at what his behaviour was actually like. Was there any kind of tension afterwards? Yeah, he got very angry because because he he understands the, the frame. He was photographing something himself when he was young. And he was sure that he was in full control because nothing, you know, he knew what I was filming. It was discussed and I couldn't do anything without his agreement. And I made myself so tiny, swallowing all insults and everything and, you know, like an idiot that when the film went in on Sundance, there was Russian press who interviewed me, and then uh, there was a major Russian newspaper who wrote a great piece about it, Gomersant. And when I got home, I got a phone call from him, and he said, are you coming by yourself? Or I should send my guys for you. And I pretended that I don't understand that he was menacing me. I said, why are you talking to me with this tone? He said, you know what? I will do a steak tartare out of you one day. So, you know, yeah, he got very angry because he thought uh, it's, it's typical, you know, how, I will tell you how I made him to agree on, on, on the film. He wrote the agreement, blah, blah, blah. Then he said, no, why should I allow? I'm a night animal, why should I? He was right. Why should I say yes to you? And I was invited to Moscow Film Festival with my previous film. I went there. I was there with Michalkov on stage. I knew it was going to be like that. And I called him, him and I invited him. So I played on ego, if you want. And when he saw the presentation of the film, he thought, well, what at the end she could do? She can't do anything nasty to me. I will be in full control. And he said, okay. I called production. The crew was there for the third day. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, that's how it started. And the same thing happened during the shoot, that I should be the most humble uh, on the set. And I should allow him to be violent towards me and not say a word. And he thought that nothing could, you know, what could I, could I do? But when the film came out, even I thought that because it was only probably 15% in the film that was really happening, you know that, I thought there was no film, that, that we, we couldn't capture what was really happening in there with these ties and with this nastiness and what he was doing. But at the end I realized that in the atmosphere of the film you get the sense of something which is which French call Orchamp, which is, you know, the general atmosphere of happening. And he got mad and he kept calling even now he calls me to say, I will get you. Yeah, referring to uh Trotsky's story. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, is, is anything working on, or just we, we talk, yeah? 
Wait for the microphone because they, they even if it's weird, the session, they're recording it. <laughs> How do you live with that like, almost constant threat? I mean, he's coming back to you every now and then. And the worst was the shoot because I thought that there will be some clashes between my guys and him, and that would be a disaster. I have a very good crew, so that was helpful, even though we were arguing and they were right. They were saying why we should undergo this. The good thing for me as a filmmaker was, as, as, as you said, you know, to film something which is on the way, which is not that obvious that then. And, um, and I think that I understood what Stalin's terror years kind of might be to experience. Even though this is nothing compared to it, I could leave, you know. I don't I not, don't know whether he would really, you know, kill me or something. But the sense that somebody is looking at you all the time, somebody might listen to you, somebody is is watching you all the time was really maddening. It was ter terrible. And I was asking myself if I were to be just you know, ordinary Russian citizen brought here by my parents or by myself, what would become out of me? Because I'm really fully convinced that human being can be broken. You cannot pretend that you would stand against any kind of force that is crushing you. How long? The death is probably the best option, you know, but how they can destroy you without killing you and what can become out of the being that you were once and what can, how can you change, you know, in order to survive. This is terrible and this is what I was observing. And this was the knowledge that I, as a person as, and as a filmmaker, probably needed to understand in order to move on. And when we were filming these arms deals between Russian parliament and Venezuelan delegation, when we were filming in, 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 um, in the sauna, all these guys naked, the generals, that this and that, discussing future of Russia, it, it seemed to be too much. But within two years, this is what happened, you know, with the, with Crimea, war in Georgia, expanding, you know, the the, the 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 frontiers of Russia and going back to Soviet Union. This incredible ambition that to become a superpower again and be against everybody. I think it was really important. But it's true that having a family and the daughter and the stuff, you ask yourself on your back. Am I insane or uh, what's wrong with me? And am I ready as a person to put it just to, you know, give in, put in danger all these people who are in a way depending on me in order to make a film? It's something insane in there, and I assume there is something insane, but I don't, I never think that filmmakers are. So, how do you get these scenes? I mean, you, you, you were filming in the sauna, you were filming the swimming pool. I mean, maybe we should just show something from another film you did about, about the Georgian. Yeah, great, fantastic. <laughs> so, we are getting to this thin, thin line. Yeah, this works. Okay. Yeah, that's great. You selected the scene. Do you, what, what, what was, what's the, tell us the purpose of it. No, this, is, this is something scene, which is, scene. you know, normally they were not supposed to meet. Yeah. But it's like playing with chemical elements. But I, she was, she's so exuberant, so sure of herself, so talkative, and he's all the contrary. Both have these poor cities. And my bet was, I didn't know that the painting would fall or something. So, and I thought, well, it, they might become friends because you need to, you know, find some, you know, some soul who will understand you because going through this pain and you think that nobody gets it, how much you suffer. And I wanted to see what could happen between them. Of course it was a setup. Of course, you know, I, I tried to arrange this meeting. But if I were to tell them, you know, na 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 na, you, it would never work. So either nothing would happen, he could come in and say, okay, I don't know, I didn't know, I couldn't predict whether it could be a scene 
or whether it would just be a flop and okay, nothing interesting might have happened. My bet was knowing one and another that she would get him to talk about who he saw and probably they will go together to see somebody and I thought how his wife might have looked at it and what could come out of it. But of course, if we are talking about the classical way of shooting documentary, you don't do this, right? But because I was free like an air and I didn't even thought that something will come out of this film and, you know, where it's heading you at the end, uh, I, I said to myself, uh, why, why don't we try to bring those two and uh, set kind of a trap or something where they could fall and let's see what, what they can do together. So, yeah. That's why I selected it, because we're talking about what's allowed, what's not allowed, what you can do, what you cannot do. Okay. Um, it's another problem. Now she has to go to deliberate the jury, and the festival is already waiting for her. So, um, <laughs> yes, 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 of course. How, sorry, how did you do that with the So did you um, tell your protect... Sorry. Did you tell your protagonist what was going on and what was your plan, and uh, how did you deal with it like in an ethical way? Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, even before I, uh, when I got the money, I, I told her, even when we finished the shoot uh, of this sequence, both of them knew at the end of uh, the sequence that I set them up. And they laughed and they said, oh, you know, you're impossible and stuff. And once he left, I called him, he came back, we had tea together, and I said, this is why. Uh, mainly I'm telling them exactly what I'm telling you now, but afterwards, because I am sure that, you know, actors are paid in a very expensive way to do this kind of things as if it was a surprise. And I don't believe that with non-professionals, you can do, you can tell them, you know, this is what I'm after. Can you? And it's somehow it's much more for me. It's much more problematic if I were to tell her, you know, I have another guy with Bush cities. Can I just pretend? Because I think that the 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 the, the lie is already there in terms of a sequence. But if, of course, I assume the part of manipulation, which is my. But um, once the sequence is done, if there is a problem for anyone saying, oh, I don't want to do it and I don't, I don't agree, you can't use it, of course. But um, for me, it was an experience of pushing these boundaries, trying to see whether these kind of things can, you know, can work in any way, and, um, and whether it was okay with my protagonists. For instance, when I showed the scene of uh, the... the, the main character and his wife arguing. Uh, of course I couldn't put it in the film without them being okay with that. Even when we had a screening uh, with commissioning editors, they say, do they know? And of course they know, and of course they're okay with that. Because at the end, what comes out of it, it's like very hidden part of human fragility rather than anything else. And the setup, in a way, helped to unveil it. When you know you're so alone with your pain, w whatever this pain might be, that you are looking for anybody. How many times we are ready to say some very personal stuff to somebody unknown to confess ourselves, rather than to a friend who knows everything about us? So yeah, Nina, but yeah, we have to wrap it up. So. Yeah, okay. So the good thing is, some of her films you can you can see them on Vimeo, yes. on yeah. the free on the yeah, internet, free. which is great. So, and I particularly recommend to watch. Tell my friends that I'm dead. <laughs> Durakovo, something about Georgia, Pipeline Next Door, <laughs> and Don't Breathe. <laughs> These films are all wonderful, and you can learn much more about Nino. And we hope we can do this again with much more time another time. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.